go live. Okay, hang on, maybe. Um, good. What? You're live. On YouTube? Well, I'm starting. Okay, but am I live on YouTube? Okay. All right, and maybe might be live. So um, I'm using an app called Starcam, which I like to use for doing live Q and A's. I've got one scheduled every Monday night at 7 p.m. Um, but I like the idea of being able to do a live on YouTube where I can actually teach and do tutorials like I normally do, but people have the opportunity to come in through Starcam. Um, so Rick and I are just troubleshooting right now to see if we're actually live on YouTube. I think I'm also talking. Okay, this is better now. So for a minute there, I was just talking and my headphones weren't on, but now they are. Um, so if you happen to be seeing this in StarCamp or on YouTube, bear with me. We're just seeing a little bit of testing right now. I do have bread to bake. I'm going to do it in just a minute, but let's just see if this is going to work. So good. End stream. It looks like it's good. Looks like it's going on YouTube, I think. Yeah. It is? Okay, good. Okay, so we are live on YouTube and live on StarCam. StarCam is an app that lets you, um, that lets you um, upload video questions and upload text questions to me. So if you're watching this live on YouTube, um, just follow along. I'm just going to um, get this loaf of bread out of the Banneton and get it into bake and just do a quick tutorial on baking. Um, but if you've got questions and you want to ask them, um, starcam.com forward slash app um, will get you, into, get you into the app and you'll see my event there. And you can actually come in and upload questions directly to me. So my name is Sarah. I'm from Sourdough for Beginners. I teach sourdough. I've got tons of tutorials on Facebook. I've got a huge um, Facebook group called Sourdough for Beginners. I've got the Facebook page um, and all of my tutorials that we share with people are on YouTube and we get them out there. Um, so today I have this dough that's in my Banneton. So yesterday I bulk proofed it to 75%. I pre-shaped it, I shaped it, I left it in the fridge overnight. Now I'm gonna bake it. My Dutch oven has been preheating in my oven for about 35 minutes. It, the oven is set at 450 degrees. That's the maximum my oven goes to. I'm going to bake the bread the whole time at 450 degrees. I'm going to put the bread in the Dutch oven with the lid on. I'm going to bake it 10 minutes. After 10 minutes, I'm going to pull it out and I'm going to check my score. If it doesn't look like my score is starting to spring, I'm not developing an ear. If it looks like the score is starting to fuse itself, then I'm going to um, recut that score to try to encourage a spring. Um, then I'm going to pop the lid back on, go another 20 minutes for a total of 30 minutes with the lid on, and then I'll bake it for 20 minutes with the lid off. And at that point, I will use my trusty meat thermometer to check the temperature, and I will bake the bread until it's 205 degrees Fahrenheit. Now I need to hustle a little bit and get this bread in because we're going to have slow-cooked pulled pork today and I need at least three or four hours to bake that, and I would really like to have supper ready exactly at six o'clock. So I'm just gonna turn my camera and show you what I've got. So I've got a piece of crinkled up tin foil. I put this in my Dutch oven underneath my parchment paper, um, and I find that this just lets some air move around underneath the dough and keeps the dough from getting too crispy on the bottom. Another thing that I do is I've got a cake tray of water on the rack underneath my Dutch oven and I leave that in for all but the last five or 10 minutes. And so the combination of the cake tray of water and the tin foil under my parchment paper in the Dutch oven keeps the bottom of the bread from getting so crusty that you can't cut through it. I've got my timer, I've got my dough and my banneton. These are silicone banneton's that I got off of um, uh, Amazon. If you're interested in what, where I got them and everything else, just comment on the video. I'll get a notification and I'll reply and put that link in for you. And I've got a piece of parchment paper. So what I'm going to do first is, let me just make it, make sure you guys can see. So I'm just going to take a little bit of flour 
Rice flour works great. I'm just using regular all-purpose. Rice flour is pretty hard to find um, in my neighborhood. I found, I've tested with rice flour. It does make your bread look nice. It stays a little bit whiter than all-purpose, but but I just use regular all-purpose to both um, layer the parchment paper as well as um, put on top of my loaf for that aesthetic look. So I'm just going to um, fold my banneton back like this. And here's my bread. So when I put it into cold proof, I have it seam up. I sewed it up. Um, I do find that with these silicone banetons, sometimes you have to do a little bit of work to separate the dough from the edges. But when I put the dough in the banetin, I do put a lot of flour in just to keep them from sticking. So with traditional banetins, you've got a, um, a layer of, um, fabric in there that you flour up but with these silicone ones you just need a little bit of extra flour to make sure that they don't stick to the banneton. So we're just going to peel this loaf out. It should just pop out if it wants to stick a little. That's fine. Let's get it out. So here we go. I like how these things are super flexible and they basically just turn completely inside out, sticking a little, but that's all right. I'll show you how to just sort of reshape your dough after it's stuck to the banetins a little bit. People ask me all the time, are the silicone banetins better than regular banetins? I think they're both kind of the same. Um, both have uh, pros and cons. So I've got my dough out of this banetin. I'm just going to slide it onto my floured parchment paper here, get it kind of nice and centered because I'm going to use the parchment paper as a sling to get the dough into the oven. Now, I don't let my dough come to room temperature after um, I've cold proofed it. I take it straight out of the fridge and bake with it right away. So I'm just going to put a nice coating of flour on top of the dough. This is optional. All the flour really does on top of the dough is make your aesthetic scores pop. So you've got three kinds of scores when it comes to sourdough. One is a functional score, and a functional score is allowing steam to escape um, and creating that oven spring in your bread. A functional score is usually close to half an inch deep. Um, either if there's just one score and you're looking for a popped up ear, then you're going to do that almost perpendicular to the counter. If you're doing multiple functional scores like an X or angled across, then you might do those straight up and down. But all they're trying to do is let the steam that's built up inside the bread escape. Your next type of score is an aesthetic score. So it's just there for looks. So those are fairly shallow and it's just where you draw your little designs that you want. And then your last kind of score is what's called a hot score. So a hot score is where you take your bread out of the, out of the oven 10 minutes in and either cut your score at all if you haven't cut it um, or recut your score just to make sure that it goes. Sometimes if your dough is overproofed, when you put it into the oven, it will start to fuse. And if it fuses, it'll prevent the dough from springing. So as that pressure builds up inside of your dough um, and then it can't escape through the score that you've cut, then either the, the, the bread will blow out in a weird way or it'll just fall back down again. Um, and with overproof dough, that's more likely to happen. So checking that score at 10 minutes gives you a chance to make sure that everything's going right with your score. Hey, could you technically bake that currently right now in that banneton? Like, could we just throw that in the oven and and not have to do any more steps? Yeah, so these, um, so just if you're watching on YouTube, um, Rick was, Rick is in the StarCam app um, and he is able to upload these video questions to me and then I can play them, replay them, pause them so I can help you troubleshoot your sourdough. So these banetons, um, when I got them, it said on the package that they're safe up to 446 degrees. And listen, lots of people are totally against using plastic in any way, and I understand that. Um, there's lots of questions as to whether it's food safe. These say that they're food safe up to 456, 446 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so I did actually test once baking my dough right in the banneton. So I put the dough in seam side down. 
let it cool proof overnight, scored it right inside of the bannetin and put it in the oven at 440 and it cooked beautiful loaves. I don't do it that often, but it is an option. And it, when we're teaching beginner sourdough, we're trying to simplify the process for everybody. So some people like that idea. Um, so let's see here. Rick's got another question. Like, could I have made a relief cut right inside that bannetin potentially and just thrown that yeah. in the oven or does that not work at all? Yeah, no, it works. The difference is, um, so if you're using the bannetins just for cold proofing, when you shape your dough before you put it in the bannetin, usually you're putting it seam side up so that when you flip it out of the bannetin, you've got sort of the top side, uh, the pretty side of your bread facing up and, and bannetins put these nice lines on and everything else, right? Um, if you're planning to bake right in the silicone bannetins, then put the seam down and then pull it out and just um go ahead and and bake it right in there so i'm going to do a functional score and an aesthetic score so that you can see the difference okay um with these oval bannetons i like my functional scores to go diagonal across i find it just maintains the shape of the bread better so these scores that i'm about to do are going to be about a half an inch deep so here we go so we'll just do four of them across here and with my functional score, it's almost always a fairly straight line, but I always cut them a second time like this, right? So these scores are deep and their purpose is to allow the bread to pop open. So when this bread goes into the oven, it's quite flat and small, but it builds up. Whereas a decorative score, so if I just turn my dough and do like some wheat ones. These are just light and they're really just there for aesthetics. They also let steam escape. They are also contributing to the oven spring of the bread, but they're more for aesthetic and so they're much shallower. So I'll just cut these sort of wheat um, stock into here. There you go. Now I think, um, YouTube comments, done. Okay, cool. So if you're watching this on YouTube, I think the idea is that I can see your comments as well if you make some, um, so feel free. So when I do these lives, I do these lives on Facebook all the time and tons of people come and they're really interactive and fun and people ask their questions. Sometimes they ask them many questions that I can't necessarily get to them. And so then that's what's transitioned me into StarCam because it lets me get to each one, one by one, and actually hear the question, see what the person is trying to say. A lot of times people on StarCam will show me their dough, show me what they're working on. Um, so anyways, I'm just doing this live today because I'm baking anyway and I wanna get this app tested on YouTube. So here we go. My dough is scored, beautiful, check it out. I've got deep functional scores and shallow um, aesthetic store scores. And I'm going to get this bread into the oven. So I'm just going to pull my hot Dutch oven out. <laughs> Excuse me. And remember, I've got a tray of water on the rack underneath the Dutch oven. That contributes to keeping the bottom of the loaf quite soft. I'm also going to put this piece of crinkled up tin foil in the bottom of the Dutch oven, and it just sort of creates an air barrier for the bread that also contributes to keeping the dough soft. So I'm just gonna use my parchment paper as a sling and drop it into the Dutch oven. So I'll just show you really quick. So it's just sitting in there, ready to go. I'm gonna pop the lid on and I'm gonna get it in there. My oven's maximum temperature is 450 degrees. So I just bake at 450 degrees the whole time. I always tell people to never go by time. I can give you a guideline of how, things, how long things are gonna take. So I'm just setting this for 10 minutes right now. And after 10 minutes, I'm gonna check that score. And if I need to, I'll recut it. In fact, I usually always just recut it no matter what. Um, it can give you a guideline. It should take somewhere between 45 and 70 minutes to bake your sourdough. But what you want is your sourdough to get to temperature. <laughs> hey, so say I was watching this event on YouTube and I noticed I wanted to be able to upload a video of my dough or my starter or whatever process I was in at the baking um, at the time. Could I just jump into StarCam? Like I could exit and jump into StarCam and upload some video questions? 
Yeah, so starcam.com forward slash app. If you type that into any browser, it'll automatically open whichever app store you're on on your phone, and you download the app. And then once you've gotten into the app, they have what's called a carousel. So all of the lives that are set up are sitting there in the carousel. So a live that's actually happening right now will come up first. So if you were on YouTube and wanted to switch into Starcam right now and try it out, as soon as you got in there, you would see Sourdough for Beginners is live right now. There's still time. Come in. And you just get in there, you push, and you'll, and then you're in here, right? Um, but you'll also see in the car carousel lives that are scheduled. So I've committed to going live every Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern time on StarCam. And I, I'm not actually teaching any tutorials. I'm just sitting there available to answer questions for people. We did one last night. There was a ton of people in there. The, the questions were queuing up, and I was able to look at the question, replay it, pause it, go through it, and actually give this one-on-one -on -one help to people. So once you're in the app, you'll see the one that I'm doing right now and be able to get in, but you'll also be able to see the ones that I have scheduled and hit register for them. So let's see. Cool. Okay. So we have our bread in the oven. Um, so we, um, I used the level two hydration beginner bread recipe. So if you're on YouTube on my channel at sourdough for beginners, please subscribe in there. There's a couple of playlists. There's a starter playlist and there's a bread baking playlist and they're sort of organized with the top videos that we most often use. The beginner bread recipe is a low hydration recipe that's meant to be easy for beginners to manage at first when they, they theoretically don't understand what each of the processes are for and what they're doing and how they're supposed to look and act. And then we've got the level two hydration, which is when you're starting to get a good feel for what the essential processes are, you're starting to feel comfortable, and now you want to start getting less dense bread, more airy bread. Um, so in most cases for me, I mix the higher hydration because it's, it's fluffier and lighter. Um, so the beginner bread recipe makes two loaves. It's 60, or sorry, 120 grams of starter, 680 grams of water, 1,000 grams of flour, and 20 grams of salt. The level two hydration is still the 1,000 grams of flour and the 20 grams of salt, but it increases the starter from 120 grams to 200 grams, and it increases the water from 680 grams to 70 grams. With that mix, you can use any flour you want. You can use basic bleached all-purpose flour, um, or you can add the sturdier flours. Now, if you start wanting to go more than 50% of a sturdier flour, like spelt, whole wheat, rye, um, einkorn, all of these really high protein content, heavy wheat flours, then you're going to need to look at increasing your hydration more. That's when you start getting into the 72 to 78% hydration. And we find that around 72% all purpose can't handle anymore. So there's all of these different adjustments that need to be made based on what you're doing. That's why there's a ton of conflicting information out there. Often the information that you're getting is based on what the person who is telling you knows or does or uses. But what we're trying to do is say, let's make it really simple at first so that the person starts to understand the science of sourdough and how it works and what things to expect and get used to feeling it with their hands and managing timing, not by the clock, by, but by what the dough or the, or the bread or the loaf is doing. And then from there, start understanding that there's more advanced processes out there. There's optional processes out there. For example, cold proofing is optional. And we often recommend that beginners skip cold proofing at first, because if you made a mistake during bulk proofing and overproofed your bread, bulk proofing is just going to magnify that, right? So super simple at first, and then we start adding on. So when I come on live like this and I'm showing you dough that I cold proofed, I'm using a more advanced process and uh, an optional process. But I think it's good for people to see how flexible everything is every time. Rick says, super awesome, best baking show in the world, the only place we can actually participate. Thanks for doing this. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Um, cool. Okay. So we've got about four minutes left until we check our hot score for the bread. Um, 
So let's just quickly talk about what you would do for your very first loaf. Let's assume that you have an active starter and that it's doubling consistently every feed. If you don't, then rewind, get onto the YouTube channel, get yourself into the starter playlist. There's a day-by-day -day tutorial for creating a starter, and then there's chats about what you're looking for with your starter. But now you've got this active starter. You can use your starter at or after peak. So once it has doubled, you can use it, but you can also use it past that point, right? It may even peak higher. You can use it way up there. It may even start to fall. You can use it down there. What happens is the longer past peak, the longer past the feed that you use the starter, the more the flour and water ferments. And so therefore the more flavor you get in your dough. Some people want as much sour flavor as they can get. Some people don't want any sour flavor at all. If you want a really sour bread, then feed your starter at one to one to one ratio. So half flour, half water, and use it way past peak. If you want your, your bread to be less sour, then consider feeding your starter a heavier flour ratio and also um, use it as close to peak as possible. For me, I like sort of a middle balance. I'd like to be able to know I'm eating sourdough. I would like that flavor, but I don't want it to be crazy. So I feed my starter right before bed, leave it on the counter, let it double, and then I mix early in the morning. After I mix, it takes five minutes or so, I let the dough rest for 30 minutes, and then I stretch and fold, and I repeat that rest 30 minutes and stretch and fold three more times for a total of four. You'll get to know what, what you're doing in, in stretching and folding, which is building strength, and when that's done, whether it's after two or five stretch and folds as you practice. But just to be safe at first, do it four times as a beginner. At that point, we're popping our dough into clear straight-sided containers and marking its height, and then we're bulk proofing on the counter somewhere between four and eight hours. Anything more than eight hours, so overnight, is probably too long and you're probably looking at overproof dough. What you're looking for is your dough to double um, or if you're going to cold proof, you want it to go to between 70 and 75%. After that, you're dumping your dough out of your bulk proofing container. You're pre-shaping it. If you're gonna bake that same day, usually I start the oven in the Dutch oven to preheat or if you're not using a Dutch oven, I just start the oven to preheat before I start pre-shaping. Pre-shape the dough, let it rest for 30 minutes, then put the final shape on the door or on the dough. Either then get it into your banatins to cold proof or score it and bake it. We recommend at first that beginners, especially for the first like two to three loaves, do it on a day when you're going to be home all day, right? Like those, sorry, I can't, I, I'm working on sourdough t-shirts are hilarious because that's really the best way to do your first sourdough. Feed your starter before bed, get up in the morning, mix, and then make it so that that bulk proofing happens when you can watch it. And if you're trying to learn about bulk proofing, then in the baking playlist on YouTube, on the YouTube channel, there is a bulk proofing success video. There's one called Here's Why You Should Watch Your Bulk Proofing. There's all of those things for you to get you through that because the most likely circumstance when you ruin your bread and get a flat loaf that didn't rise is because you didn't bulk proof effectively. And if you didn't bulk proof effectively, then probably cold proofing is just going to make it worse, right? Um, Rick sent a question. Let's see what he says. Should I always double cut into a loaf um, just to make sure my scoring's extra deep and really uh, pronounced and that I get that great ear? Or sometimes is that not necessary? Um, I don't think it's necessary. What you really want is just to make sure that you have a cut in your dough that's half an inch deep. So if you've got a really sharp razor and it does half an inch on the next or on the first swipe, that's good. If you want, if you're doing a round loaf and you want that ear that you see in the pictures, you need to cut your dough almost perpendicular or almost parallel to the counter. So my time is just going off. I'll show you this hot score in one second. Um, if you don't, want that ear. So if you want your loaf to spring, but you don't want to get that big pronounced ear, then you can do your score straight up and down, right? So when you see those famous ears on the, um, on the, uh, on the Facebook pictures and everything else, um, it's because of the way they've cut their score. And again, for beginners, this is just something that we can practice. So we say as a beginner, at first, just get a good functional score into your bread 
Um, and then after that, um, you can start experimenting with your score. So if you look at this bread right now, and I can only hold this Dutch oven for so long before it breaks me. So let me just point this downwards like this. So this bread is holding its, its score. You can see that the scores are still deep and they're even starting to open up a little bit, right? This bread is not having issues with holding the score. I'm just gonna get it back in and reset my, my timer and explain what that means. These Dutch ovens are so heavy. Um, so that bread is holding its score. It doesn't need to be recut. Now, if I had pulled that bread out and those scores, like if you saw, they, those scores were shaped like a V. So the cut that I had put there not only had stayed as deep as I had made it, but they're starting to open up. That's a really good indicator that this bread is going to spring, right? I knew this bread was probably going to spring because I properly proofed it yesterday and I cold proofed it overnight, right? Um, so, we're just going to cold proof. Oh, okay. Um, so we so we know it's okay, but it's good to understand that if you know that you've overproofed your dough, um, you can do this hot score ten minutes in to try to get um, try to get it to spring properly. Greg's got a question here. Hi, Sarah. Great show. Uh, lots of information. I'm learning a lot here. Uh, my question is, I, I I'd like to know, can you make a a swirl bread, like I, I buy this uh, store, I buy this, uh, it's part pumpernickel and, and part rye or something else. I know pumpernickel is like, like rye, but I feel like it would be kind of cool to do sourdough and rye or sourdough or two types of sourdough. Like, you know what I mean by how they make, yeah. I don't even know how to do it. I'm asking you, how do you do yeah. How would you make the swirl bread with sourdough? So, so you can actually make um, sourdough rye bread and sourdough pumpernickel bread. So all bread has a rising agent, right? Um, sometimes it's yeast, which you just buy like, um, you know, like Fleischmann's makes it, right? So this is just like regular quick rise yeast. You need to have yeast in order to get a bread to rise. All a starter is is a wild yeast, a fermented yeast that you've created yourself. So you can create a rye bread um, using all rye flour. So you just use your regular sourdough starter and do all rye flour. All rye flour is a little harder. You need a lot more hydration to do it. And then same thing, all pumpernickel is. I told that you might find this interesting, Greg. Um, all pumpernickel is is regular sourdough with um, some molasses and some cocoa added, believe it or not. And then there's a, there's a seed um, that they add. Hang on, let me see if I can find it. I have it. Um, I forget, they're not called, they might, might be called fennel. I can't remember what they are, but I wonder if I can find them. Anyhow, you take your regular sourdough bread and then you just add some cocoa and some molasses to the bread. And that's what gives you that pumpernickel flavor. And then whatever this seed is, even though I can't find it right now, um, you sort of put that throughout. So in order to make this one that you're talking about, you would just make a regular sourdough dough and a regular either pumpernickel or rye dough. I would probably let them rise separately and then at shaping time, pre-shape the two of them and then just put them together and pre-shape the, roll them up together and you'll end up with that, that swirl. So that would be very fun. I feel like I have to try that. Rick's always telling me, you used to make me bagels, and you have to try this, and you have to try that. Um, but the biggest problem is finding time. So I, um, I don't know how many people are watching this on YouTube because I'm in the StarCam app. I can't actually see. Um, I have been checking to see if there's any comments in the, on the YouTube app. I'm not seeing any, um, but this is really fun. So what I have left now is uh, about uh, 15 minutes on my bread with the lid on. And then after that 15 minutes, I'm going to take the lid off. I'm going to cook it for 20 more minutes with the lid off. At that point, I'm going to pull the tray out from underneath my um, Dutch oven, and I'm going to start checking the temperature. I'm going to cook the bread until it's all the way at 205 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and I feel pretty confident that this one is going to be beautiful. I know it was properly proofed. Um, 
and then I'm going to let it cool for two or three hours. So I'm making pulled pork for supper tonight, and I'm hoping to eat those pulled pork sandwiches on this nice, fresh bread. So what I need is for it to be out of the oven um, no later than 2.15 um, and get my pulled pork in, and then by the time supper comes, we'll be able to cut into it. You definitely want to make sure that you let your bread cool at least an hour um, preferably two or three hours. With the beginner bread recipe, if you mix in the morning, stretch and fold for two hours, bulk proof for somewhere between four and eight hours, and bake the same day, usually it works out that it's after supper by the time the bread is baked. So then you can just leave it out on the counter and let it um, cool all night. Um, so I'm going to wrap up for today. I appreciate all of you who came and watched this. I appreciate all of you who saw sort of the technical struggles at first. Um, I feel like this is just going to get easier and easier as we go, um, but I'm going to wrap it up for today and um, see you all again soon. Um, let's see here one sec. I just saw a couple more people pop in. If there's any, I'll wait a minute or two in case there's any questions. If you've got, just, just because as I turned off the question submission, I noticed that the attendees jump up a little bit. So let's see. If someone's got a question, upload it quick. Um, cookie, cool. Hey, sourdough. I have a sourdough question. Um, is there a sourdough school that I could go to to be an expert in sourdough? Uh, do you have a course that you can uh, I can enroll in because I really like sourdough? I also like donuts. Do you make donuts as well? Let me know. That's a really good question, Cookie. So um, our main focus is getting people making sourdough at all. I would, I don't know if I would call myself an expert, like the kind of stuff that you see um, at bread schools. Like there's one in um, Korea called, they call the paint. And there's another one in uh, France or Italy that my friend Julie and I always talk about going to. I would love to do that. But what I do have is I have the YouTube channel there's the Baker's Playlist. You could follow through those videos one by one, and I guarantee you, you would be able to make sourdough. Um, I The best thing you can do is get somebody to gift you a starter. Um, so if you knew someone who had sourdough starter and you got some from them, you'd be able to start baking right away. But if not, go into the starter playlist. You can make your own starter. Um, I also, I do sell private, um, private uh, virtual training. Um, it costs a couple hundred bucks, but the way I see it is that within a day or two, um, I can get you set up and baking almost perfect sourdough. So that was a really good question. All of those things are linked um, everywhere on all of my pages. So sourdoughforbeginners.com has all my books and that one-on-one -on -one instruction, and you can get the dehydrated sourdough there or sorry, the dehydrated starter, everything you could need. And then, of course, I've just got endless video tutorials. So. That was a great question. All right, I'm going to wrap it up for today, um, 12 minutes before I take my lid off. If you want to see the whole baking process, then go on YouTube and see all of those tutorials that are there. For all of you who 